Rockport Music is dedicated to fostering an appreciation of music through accessible programs for people of all ages. We would like to thank our corporate partners for their continued support in making this happen. Hi everyone, I'm Gabriela Diaz, co-artistic director of Windsor Music. Thank you so much for joining us today for this exploration and performance of Samuel Coleridge Taylor's lush and gorgeous clarinet quintet. We're so excited to be here in the Shalin Lu Performance Center, this stunning and incredible hall, and on this truly perfect day. And thank you so much to Rockport Music for having us. Today marks an exciting collaboration between three dynamic Boston-based organizations, Windsor Music, a beloved chamber music and outreach organization, Castle of Our Skins, a concert and educational series dedicated to celebrating black artistry through music, and Project Step, a string training program that has provided talented young musicians that identify with historically underrepresented groups in classical music with comprehensive music instruction. We're so happy to be here today to play for you and with each other, and we're so excited that Christian Cassiano with Project Step will be joining us. Hello, I'm Ronnie Moore, co-artistic director and clarinetist for Windsor Music. Samuel Coleridge Taylor was a student at the Royal College of Music in 1895 and 20 years old when he composed his clarinet quintet in F sharp minor. At that time, Johannes Brahms' music was very popular in England. Brahms had basically given up composition at that time and was wooed out of retirement by the sweet and compelling sounds of the clarinet. He ended up writing four pieces of chamber music for clarinet, including a massive clarinet quintet in 1891. In this case, clarinet quintet means string quartet plus clarinet. In 1895, a performance of that Brahms Quintet was done at the Royal College. As the story goes, after that performance, Coleridge Taylor's teacher, Charles Stanford, challenged his students to write a clarinet quintet that was truly original, immune from the ubiquitous influence of Brahms. Coleridge Taylor took that challenge seriously and wrote his clarinet quintet in F sharp minor in two months. After looking carefully at the score, Stanford said to Coleridge Taylor enthusiastically, you've done it. Stanford was so impressed by Coleridge Taylor's work that he took it to famed violinist Josef Joachim, Brahms' friend and collaborator. Joachim rehearsed it in Berlin with his quartet and has had praise for the piece as well. With the advantage of time, we can indeed here, more than a bit of Brahmsian romantic influence, as well as other composers like Dvorak and Grieg. But we also do hear a unique voice of prodigious talent emerging within this beautifully constructed work. This quintet is lushly scored, large in scale, and symphonic sounding. It's a true ensemble piece, not just a vehicle for a virtual display by the clarinet. In fact, the violin, Coleridge Taylor's first instrument, takes an equally important role. It's full of tuneful melodies. I know I've been humming the tunes nonstop since we started rehearsing. And it's really no wonder his music enjoyed such wide appeal. Of local interest to those in the Boston area, in 1906 on one of his US tours, the clarinet quintet was played in Jordan Hall with members from the Boston Symphony Orchestra. Coleridge Taylor's quintet uses clarinet in A, just like the Brahms, and the most famous clarinet quintet before that by Mozart. Instead of writing the piece in A major, he uses the related key of F sharp minor. The first movement of this piece, Allegro Energico, is the largest of the four movements. Listen to the stormy and slightly unsettled F sharp minor where the piece begins and how it alternates swiftly to a heroic and sometimes sweet sounding A major and back again. <laughs> Thank you. 
Hello, my name is Ashley Gordon, and I am the Artistic and Executive Director of Kessel of Our Skins, a concert and educational series based in Boston dedicated to celebrating black artistry through music, as well as the violist. I'd love to give you a brief overview of the second, third, and fourth movements of Samuel Coleridge Taylor's clarinet quintet. The second movement, entitled Larghetto Effetuoso, is a tender folk melody that sounds so natural it feels instantly familiar. Performed first on clarinet, before making its way in subtle variations throughout the entire ensemble, it evokes a feeling of deep affection and care. Let's hear the gorgeous opening theme performed on the clarinet over a subdued ensemble of muted violins and tranquil viola and cello. Samuel Coleridge Taylor's third movement is a classic scherzo trio form that was common during his lifetime. The boisterous scherzo material is contrasted by a slower trio section full of heart achingly beautiful melodies woven into the clarinet part. Musically, Samuel Coleridge Taylor changes the rhythmic character, moving from a very flowing and prancing feel of 9 8 to a much more strict and almost aggressive feel of 3-4, all while keeping the same pulse. We'll play one of these instances right now for you. Now we have arrived at the rollicking last movement, the epic finale. In this movement, you may hear elements of Dvorak, right from the first bar in the accompanimental figures in the viola and second violin, and folk-like melody heard in the clarinet. This movement has two main motives, the energetic folk-like material that opens the piece, and a beautiful lyrical theme. These two motifs alternate back and forth throughout the entire movement. We'll play both of these motifs for you. Here is the first. <laughs> And now here is the gorgeous and tuneful second motif, heard first in duet form with the clarinet and second violin, and then in the first violin.
As we near the close of the movement, you'll hear the beautiful melody of the second movement as a kind of distant memory and surprise return of the joyful first movement, altered much faster and a kind of dizzying finish to this 30 minute work. Now, please enjoy the entire clarinet quintet in F sharp minor by Samuel Coleridge Taylor. <laughs>
Samuel Coleridge Taylor was born in central London, England in 1875. His father had come to London from Sierra Leone to study medicine, but was forced to return to his home country around the time of Samuel's birth because he was not permitted to practice medicine in England because of his race. He left England without knowing that Samuel's mother, Alice, was pregnant and never met his son. Coleridge Taylor was raised in England by Alice and her family. His mother's family was musical. She had a brother who was a professional musician and a father that played the violin. Coleridge Taylor was given his first violin by his grandfather, who also taught him how to play. He showed great facility for music early on and joined a local church choir. At choir practice, he was noticed by a wealthy amateur musician who encouraged Coleridge Taylor's musical education and helped him apply to the Royal College of Music in 1890. He was admitted at the young age of 15. He was one of the first black students to be admitted to the college. He entered on a scholarship to study violin, but soon switched to composition. And for all you music lovers, the head of the Royal College at this time was Charles Grove. He is the person who admitted Coleridge Taylor, and he is the author of the Grove Encyclopedia of Music. Coleridge Taylor's talent was widely recognized at the Royal College. One of his main teachers was the composer and conductor Charles Stanford. Stanford, overhearing another student deliver a racial insult, told him that Coleridge Taylor had more music in his little finger than the other student had in his whole body. All accounts from his time at the Royal College indicated that he excelled in all of his studies. His piano teacher wrote on an end of term report, one of my cleverest pupils. Coleridge Taylor studied at the Royal College for seven years. While at the Royal College, Coleridge Taylor met a young piano student, Jessie Walmsley. She was looking for a violinist to work on some Schubert duos with, and their relationship began in 1892, and they married in 1899. Jessie's family initially objected to her marriage on account of Coleridge Taylor's mixed race, but seeing his rise to international fame, the family finally relented and even attended their wedding. The couple had a son named Hiawatha, who as an adult went on to conduct performances of his father's works and a daughter, Gwendolyn Avril, who started composing at an early age and later became a conductor and a composer herself. In 1896, the African-American poet and novelist Paul Lawrence Dunbar visited London. When Coleridge Taylor heard that this important poet was in London, he went to Dunbar's house and asked for permission to set some of his poems to music. Dunbar agreed, and Coleridge Taylor's work, African Romances, was published later the same year. This was the start of a beautiful relationship between the two artists. Samuel Coleridge Taylor would become best known for his trilogy of cantatas for solo voice, choir, and orchestra known as the Song of Hiawatha. These were based on Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's poem of the same name, which tells the adventures of a Native American hero called Hiawatha and his love, Minnehaha. Coleridge Taylor was 23 years old when he wrote the first of these three works, Hiawatha's Wedding Feast. It was first performed at the Royal College of Music in 1898. The first performance was described as one of the most remarkable events in modern English musical history. The success of the work was immediate and international. He would add two more cantatas on the same subject to complete this trilogy. Coleridge Taylor strongly identified with the narrative of this story and the problems and struggles of racism towards indigenous peoples. In his biography of Samuel Coleridge Taylor, William Tortolano wrote, Coleridge Taylor was innately shy about and even contemptuous of publicity and attention. When the finished work was performed to a wildly enthusiastic audience at the Royal College, it was necessary for Stanford to leave the stage and seek out the composer. Every London paper devoted considerable space to this unusual work, and without exception acclaimed it as an artistic masterpiece. Coleridge Taylor received only 15 guineas for the outright sale of his opus. Although hundreds of thousands of copies were sold in subsequent years, 
the 15 guineas remained the composer's total income for his masterpiece as he sold the copyright for the first printing and performance. For the 30 years in between the two world wars, Royal Albert Hall would produce Hiawatha Season, in which the entire trilogy would be performed every night for two weeks. The first performance of Hiawatha in the United States was actually close by in Massachusetts in Boston. The Cecilia Society of Boston gave the first performance in 1900. The Song of Hiawatha was a huge success and Coleridge Taylor soon became a celebrity. Hiawatha was performed by choral societies across England, often conducted by Coleridge Taylor himself. By 1904, it had been performed 200 times in England. In 1899, Coleridge Taylor first heard African-American spirituals sung by the Fisk Jubilee Singers on one of their tours to England. He became interested in African-American folk songs and began incorporating them into his works. The early 20th century marked the beginning of the Pan-African movement. The Pan-African movement advocated for black communities to embrace their African heritage and cultural roots. Coleridge Taylor was the youngest delegate to participate in the first Pan-African Conference in 1900, when he was only 25. There were 37 delegates from Africa, the West Indies, America, and the UK. Bishop Alexander Walters said in his opening address that, for the first time in history, black people had gathered from all parts of the globe to discuss and improve the condition of their race, to assert their rights, and to organize so that they might take an equal place among nations. Coleridge Taylor spent time both in Africa and America, where he developed relationships with leading thinkers and activists fighting for racial equality. In 1902, a group of African-American music lovers formed the Samuel Coleridge Taylor Society to perform and promote his music. They brought Coleridge Taylor to America for three successful tours in the early 20th century. During his 1904 tour, Coleridge Taylor found himself a major celebrity in America. He conducted the Marine Band along with the Coleridge Taylor Society Chorus. He was the first black man to conduct a white orchestra. On his first tour to America, he met with Booker T. Washington and also with President Teddy Roosevelt. In 1905, Coleridge Taylor's 24 Negro Melodies was published. This volume of African and African American songs were presented by the composer as a collection of folk music. In their introduction to this work, he stated his aim. What Brahms has done for the Hungarian folk music, Dvorak for the Bohemian, and Grieg for the Norwegian, I have tried to do for Negro Melodies. Booker T. Washington says in the preface to the work, using some of the native songs of Africa and the West Indies with songs that came into being in America during the slavery regime, he has, in handling these melodies, preserved their distinctive traits and individuality, at the same time, giving them an art form fully imbued with their essential spirit. Coleridge Taylor's success and fame did not exclude him from racial abuse. His daughter wrote that when they would encounter local young people who would often make comments about the color of his skin, when he saw them approaching along the street, he held my hand more tightly, gripping it until it almost hurt. In 1912, Coleridge Taylor died suddenly and unexpectedly. He collapsed at a train station and died of pneumonia a few days later. Huge crowds attended Coleridge Taylor's funeral in South London there was a national outpouring of grief over his death. Coleridge Taylor had become a beacon of hope for the black community. Later that year, a benefit concert was held for his family at Royal Albert Hall. So many people were shocked by the way in which Coleridge Taylor had profited so little from the amazing commercial successes of his works. This outrage led to the establishment of the Performing Rights Society. Until World War II, the Hiawatha works would remain some of the most performed choral pieces in Britain, their popularity rivaled only by Handel's Messiah and Mendelssohn's Elijah. Samuel Coleridge Taylor was not only an exceptional artist, but a trailblazer, an advocate for black culture whose influence has been felt far beyond the musical sphere.